What's good everyone and welcome back to another reaction video. Today we're reacting to the most impressive heist of all time. Originally I was going to do the other FNAF explanation thing in parts, but uh, didn't really have the time for it this week. I So if you do enjoy this uh, reaction video, hit the like button below. Hit the subscribe button to support the channel, support the content provided, and so on and so forth. Hit the notification button to be notified immediately when your video comes out. And if you have any videos you would like to recommend that I should react to, put it down in the comment section below and I'll react to it as soon as possible. Now, unless the link to this video will be down in the description. So if you want to check out the original video yourself, go ahead, look there. And it's going to be there. You can uh, pause this video right now and check out the original. Or just stay on and do whatever, I guess. Uh, but yeah. Be sure to give the creator love and support for the video they made. They put a lot of work into this. So let's give them some love and support for it. Now, uh, with this all said... For real, let's start this video. Crime never pays. At least that's how the old saying goes. But is it actually true? Well, if you're one of the belligerent burglars or bank robbers we're covering today, it definitely does pay. A lot. Their rousing rustles have raked in millions, if not billions of dollars. And while I don't condone how they did it, you gotta put respect on the name. Stay alert, detectives. These guys could be armed and are definitely dangerous. Let's look at the most impressive heists of all time. So I am right. It is legitimate heist that happened in history. I'm surprised this thing didn't get demonetized because some people just don't like talking about this stuff or get... Uh, get a bit of cold feet when it comes to uploading this kind of stuff. At least, that's why I heard what people say. Scary stories are one thing, but police stuff... A lot of the stuff is demonetized. Or has a lot of stuff muted, cut, and whatnot. So... It's impressive that he was able to do this with no problems. I don't know if that's a me thing or something else. Buenos Aires bus stop. Huh? We interrupt this video with breaking news. Five men have taken hostages at Banco Rio in Buenos Aires. Police have established a perimeter around the building and are communicating with one of the burglars. Strangely, the gang has been heard singing happy birthday to one of the hostages and requesting police send them pizza. We'll keep you posted. Yep, what? in 2006, a mind-boggling standoff went down in Buenos Aires. Five armed men in masks marched in through the bank's doors in broad daylight. In the ensuing hours, police officers were taunted with a phone call requesting pizza and the sound of joyous happy birthdays. However, when special forces tentatively entered the building, the robbers were gone. Even more weirdly, nobody had seen them leave. Huh? The only signs a robbery had even taken place were 143 busted open safety deposit boxes, a what? jackhammer, a neat row of fake guns, and a note saying, in a neighborhood of rich people without weapons or grudges, it's just money, not love. Hmm. Whoever perpetrated this must have been a master criminal, right? Well, not quite. The master genius behind it all was one Fernando Araujo. And he was, well, kind of a bum. Following a recent huh? heartbreak, Araujo was coasting through life. Then, one day, possessed by a stroke of genius, he conceptualized pulling off the perfect bank robbery, as we all do after getting dumped. But Araujo really thought he was onto something. He recruited his good friend Sebastian Garcia Bolster, a hobbyist engineer, to help him hash out some of the details. 
First off, there was a sophisticated alarm system protecting the bank. With no conceivable way to disable it, Araujo decided that the robbery had to occur during the day, when the bank was open, and the alarm disabled. That's when Araujo had his craziest idea. What if you could rob a bank and never leave? Jeez, what? what a whack job. However, there was something to Araujo. Okay, this is crazy sounding. The people who robbed the bank weren't there. They weren't there when the police went, came there. They were talking about getting pizza. Like, seriously? I mean, they try to bargain for pizza and all that for a party. Something I don't get. And... They have all the tools and all that, along with fake weapons. And surprise, surprise, no one could figure out how they left because there was no evidence of them leaving. What the frick? Oh, this crazy plan. See, Buenos Aires is built above a complex network of storm sewers. For months prior uh -huh. to the heist, Bolster had been driving to Peru Beach, where one of the waterlogged tunnels emptied into the Rio de la Plata. He'd then slosh all the way through it to a manhole cover near the bank. Now, after performing some complex calculations to establish the correct angle of attack, Bolster gradually chipped away through the rock towards the bank, right until there was only a sliver left of it so bank staff wouldn't notice but it would be easy to finish the job when the time came. So when Araujo said they'd never leave, he just meant they'd never be seen leaving. And that's what the tunnel was for. This whole hostage debacle upstairs was merely a distraction from the real robbery going on downstairs. Okay, that's pretty genius. Bolster's final task was figuring out how to get into the safety deposit boxes. This oh. was easy. He went to a neighborhood branch of the bank and rented out a safety deposit box, noted the brand, and then bought test boxes from the manufacturer. After some testing, he found the most efficient way of breaking into the boxes was with a jackhammer, but they're cumbersome. So Bolster designed his own, which could be assembled and disassembled quickly for ease of transportation. With that, everything was set for the big day. Araujo rounded up a gang of crooks to conduct the fake robbery upstairs, complete with toy guns. After they entered the bank, one of the robbers ventured into the basement and broke through the last remaining section of the wall to let Bolster in and start the real robbery. Once Bolster was inside, okay. Araujo started his stopwatch. He knew the standoff with the police outside wouldn't last forever, so he gave them two hours to smash and grab as much as they could. All the while, the robbers kept the police and hostages distracted upstairs. It took 20 minutes for Bolster to assemble the jackhammer and get to work. Araujo and another robber stood nearby, stuffing cash and other valuables into the bags. When the two-hour timer went off, one of the burglars placed the pizza call. Immediately, the gang started pouring bleach all over the basement to destroy any DNA, and then scattered around human hair they'd acquired from a nearby barber shop. That way, if anyone left any traces, it would be near impossible to distinguish it. That's genius. Kay. Finally, the men cleared any evidence of the wall breach, ducked into the tunnel, and heaved a heavy cabinet over the hole. Anyone who entered the room would have no idea this is where the burglars had entered. The gang then sailed ten blocks on inflatable dinghies they'd left in the tunnel earlier to a spot below where they'd parked a getaway van. They scurried up a ladder, bringing the pilfered goods with them, then removed the ladder, leaving no sign of their escape. By the time special forces entered the bank and found the hostages, the gang was watching it live on TV while counting cash and eating pizza. Sheesh. Now time for the golden question. How much moolah are we talking? Well, estimates put it in the region of an eye-watering $20 million in Holy. cash and valuables. 
Oof, not a bad haul, right? Indeed, reporters were still talking about it for weeks, dubbing it the crime of this century. The identity of the thieves became a matter of mass speculation. Who'd pulled off this perfect crime? Now hold on, if this really was the perfect crime, then how can we know about it? Who snitched? Well, one of the robbers, Beto de la Toro, was out enjoying a romantic evening with his girlfriend when the police pulled him over and swamped his car. Turns out, Beto had a wife at home who wasn't so happy with his no-good cheating ass. In a spit of rage, she'd ratted on Beto about the robbery and was able to ID the others too because she'd seen them scheming in her garage. Yikes, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. If Beto had just kept it in his pants, we'd still be none the wiser. Just like Beto's wife ratted on him, someone close to you told me you haven't clicked those like and subscribe buttons. Wow, that's the uh. worst crime I've ever heard. You better fix that now or I'm calling the police on you. Woo! Great choice. Now let's get back to the video. This is something to really think about, I guess. Honestly, I'm stunned right now. Like, everything's going way over my head now. But I have to admit, it was a smart idea. Genius, actually. It was a perfectly planned and all that. Like, no joke. The only thing that was at fault, and they would have gotten away with it, was that the was that he cheated on his wife, and she ran him him out in a fit of spiteful rage. That's kind of crazy. Hats off to Hatton. If mm. I asked you what an average robber looked like, what would you say? Big, tough guy, mask, stripy shirt. No. I'd say guy with gloves wearing a mask that covers a large majority of their face. Along with like either like a long sleeve or coat. Along with some kind of like baggy pants and some kind of either regular shoes or some like heavy boots or something like that. That's what I think of when I think of robber. Sure. You probably wouldn't describe the Hatton Garden robbers. In 2015, this group of ruffians broke into the Hatton Garden safety deposit box facility in London and made off with $17 million worth of jewelry Damn. and cash. Yikes. Except these weren't your usual band of crooks. See, Mr. Strong, Ginger, and Montana, and the gent, the tall man, and the old man were a gang of pensioners. What? Huh? Okay, the youngest member was a sprightly 48, so not that old. But the leader and oldest member, Brian Reeder, was 76. Who said crime was a young man's game? But these weren't your average OAPs. Each of them was as long in the crime game as they were in the tooth. Their master plan involved striking at night. First, the thieves had to get through two security doors, one of which was protected by a four-digit pin. Whether the thieves knew the code or found a way to jimmy the lock, we don't know. There was no sign of force entry, though, so it seems one of them had prior access. Hmm. Once inside... Some members moved the elevator car up to the second floor before okay. disabling it. This opened the way for one of our acrobatic ancients to abseil down to the basement, where the vault was. Once they'd reached like, their destination, they pulled open the elevator... Like Mission Impossible? No, that wouldn't make sense. Actually, it would make sense. Was it like Mission Impossible? Because it kind of sounds like it. Vader shutters and entered to allow access from the courtyard, where the rest of the gang was waiting with heavy tools. They simply slid two bolts open on the basement floor. Now, there was only one obstacle in the way, the vault door itself. No problem. Rather than fiddling about with it, the gang got to work drilling a hole through the 20 inches of concrete wall next to it. 
There was a metal cabinet on the mm. other side of the hole, though, blocking their access. Again, no problem. Using a hydraulic battering ram, they knocked it over, clearing the way to climb inside. Then, they smashed the locks on 73 of the 999 safety deposit boxes and snatched the heaps of jewelry and precious stones That within. is impressive. The goods were loaded into wheelable trash cans and carried back out towards the fire escape, where a white van was waiting. Finally, they hauled their $17 million load into the back and drove off just as the sun was coming up all without having to harm a single person. How awesome. So, how'd Gummy Gang get busted? Did they leave empty butterscotch wrappers at the scene? Well, the answer might be even sillier than that. Some of the crooks had been captured on CCTV arriving in style inside a white Mercedes E200 with a black roof and black alloy wheels. If you're thinking, gee, that's a distinctive looking car, you'd be right. After a quick number plate scan, the police tracked the car down to one John Kelly Collins. Police bugged Kelly's car, and eavesdropped on the gang bragging about their ill-gotten gains. All members pled guilty and got sentences, but only $5.25 million of the pilfered goods was ever recovered. As for the rest? Shh. Haven't you ever heard of snitches get stitches? Lazarus heist. So we've... Okay, I have to admit, these two heists so far have been really impressive. Well thought out, well... I... Well maneuvered, and... Gosh, they were prepared for every single thing. Only thing that's weird is the fact that... How they got caught. Like, if it wasn't for a certain case scenario, they would have been scot-free. Hmm. We've covered the old-fashioned smash-and-grab Hollywood-style shakedowns. But how about something a little more sophisticated? Well, in 2016, Bangladesh's National Bank was the target of a billion-dollar bust-up without anyone ever actually setting foot in the building. Huh? Yep. In fact, the perpetrators weren't even within a thousand miles of Bangladesh. They didn't need to be. They were computer hackers. Access to the bank's central computer network had been gained a year prior. An innocuous email from a job seeker named Razal Aklam appeared in the inbox of one of the employees. Only, Razal Aklam didn't exist. His resume was a sophisticated virus that kicked down the virtual doors into the mainframe. But the bank didn't okay. know any the wiser. The first sign that something was wrong happened on the morning of Friday, the 5th of February. A printer on the 10th floor in the main building in Dhaka had malfunctioned. Whatever. Computer issues happen to everyone. However, this wasn't any old printer. It had the very important task of printing out records of multi-million dollar transactions in and out of the bank. Staff managed to get it fixed by Saturday, but upon restarting, it began spitting out urgent request records from the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. See, Bangladesh held most of their money in a U.S. dollar account with the Federal Reserve Bank for safekeeping. Uh -huh. This printer was suddenly churning out urgent messages from the Fed saying they'd received instructions to drain the entire account, close to a billion dollars. The hack had started days before, at 8 p.m. on Thursday night, Bangladesh time. Okay. This was Thursday morning in New York, giving the Fed plenty of time to carry out the requests while Bangladeshi's staff were off duty. What's more... Bangladesh's weekend runs Friday to Saturday, unlike New York's, which runs Saturday to Sunday. So, by the time the few staff that were on duty noticed anything was wrong in Bangladesh, it was the weekend in New York. Plus, the following Monday was a national holiday across many parts okay. of Asia. Knowing this, the hackers had set up bank accounts in the Philippines to transfer the money to. Nobody in the Philippines was any wiser due to... Alright, so, 
No one was none the wiser during Friday and Saturday in one area. And in and the other, no one was aware during Saturday and Sunday. So it transfers. Okay. So they did it on Thursday. And Friday, which one part wouldn't notice. And if one part didn't notice, the other side wouldn't notice immediately. But then the next day, they would have to stop looking because it was the weekend and they wouldn't have noticed. And because of the faulty stuff and there being no messages being delivered for until Monday, that would have already left four days left. And wow, this is really complicated. Due to the national holiday. So, in total, oh, national holiday this manipulation too. of time zones bought the wily hackers five whole days to get the money and vanish. But who were they? This seems way too sophisticated for some run of the mill computer geeks. Yep. It was. Shockingly, the perpetrators are known as the Lazarus Group, a mysterious group of hackers with concrete ties to the North Korean regime. Whoa. Some North Korean defectors allege they're a state-sponsored hacking organization known locally as 414 Liaison Office that conducts okay. cyber warfare operations on behalf of the government. Crikey. After accessing the bank's computer system on the Thursday night, the hacking team had compromised their online messaging system, which showed records of any attempted transactions. Now, if anyone tried to log on, they'd be greeted with an error. But there was still the issue of the printer, which would automatically print said transactions anyway. So they installed software that wrote it out of action for a few days, then began siphoning money out of the account. Why North Korea targeted Bangladesh specifically, we don't know. They deny having any involvement. We do know heavy international sanctions had left them strapped for cash, though. Still... It's kind of crazy to think that they nearly made off with a billion dollars. Yep, I said nearly. All See, right. if it wasn't for a few tiny errors, they would have gotten away with it. But they didn't. Remember the bank accounts set up in the Philippines to wire the money to? Well, the bank branch that the hackers used was on Jupiter Street. Sadly, Jupiter was also the name of a sanctioned Iranian shipping vessel. Because of this, the Fed had an automatic barricade set up for transactions containing the word Jupiter, in case people were trying to sneak money where they shouldn't be. So all but five transfers were blocked. However, those five transfers were worth a whopping $101 million. Damn. Was that was kind of weird, though, to have that kind of specific thing. But hey, if it works for them, it works for them, I guess. But jeez, that is a really specific thing. Too specific. And it's weird. Of that $101 million, $20 million was sent to a Sri Lankan charity called the Shalika Foundation. Aw, they donated some to charity. How sweet. <laughs> Not quite. See, stealing money digitally isn't as easy as you'd think. If you were to transfer a large sum of money, it doesn't sit in an account as a $20 million lump sum. It gets mixed up with all of the other foundation's other money. In case you haven't figured it out by now, the Shalika Foundation had also been hacked by the Lazarus Group. The plan was to send the money from Bangladesh to Shalika and then onwards. By making multiple transfers of different amounts to different recipients, and then moving the money on again and again, it becomes almost untraceable. Damn. Unfortunately for the hackers, a typing error in the donation message called the Shalika Foundation the Shalika Foundation, catching the eye of an employee. I mean, if you're donating $20 million to charity, you're going to proofread it, right? This keen-eyed observer reversed the transaction just to be safe, meaning another $20 million slipped through the hacker's fingers. Still, 
$81 million is no mean sum to get away with. Sure, it could have been worse, but it was still a devastating blow for Bangladesh, where one in five people currently live below the poverty line. Yikes. I mm. sure hope they've done all right recovering. Pillage at the pier. I mean, worst place to do it at, considering poverty issues. But it's kind of incredible that they actually managed to do that. And also hilarious that they got uh, messed up just to either, one, a coincidence, and two, misspelling. I honestly find it hilarious, to be honest. Uh, crime doesn't usually pay well. Oh, last year I woke up with such a sore head. But if you'd stayed at the Pierre Hotel in New York for New Year's in 1972, you'd be waking up with a sore wallet, too. What? Not only does this luxury hotel cost a pretty penny, but it was the stage of the largest hotel robbery of all time. Associates from the Rochester crime family and the Lucchese crime family, two of New York's most notorious syndicates, hit the hotel just before 4 a.m. They arrived dressed to the nines and told security they okay. had a reservation under Dr. Foster. After confirming the reservation with reception, they were allowed to enter. And that's when things took off. One member held the security guard at gunpoint, while another went around and rounded up the hotel crew. They were running with a skeleton team following the holidays, as most guests were sleeping off their celebrations. To maintain the gang's low profile, one of the robbers stationed himself on the hotel phone. If any uh. guests called down with a query or a complaint about their pillows, the gang would send someone up to take care of them. Oh, that's kinda... sweet. I now, guess. the thieves weren't after the stash of hotel pillow chocolates. See, all the well-to-do guests had been wearing out their finest jewelry to look the part at these expensive parties. And before going to sleep, it was likely they'd stored their valuables in the hotel lockboxes for safekeeping. So, the thieves beelined for those boxes, targeting names they recognized, like American real estate entrepreneur Harold Uris and MLB executive Tom Yaki. We're talking real big money players. Lo and behold, one box mm. contained a staggering $500,000 cash. Holy. And another contained a designer diamond necklace worth a mind-boggling $750,000. Over uh. two hours, the gang raided 208 lockboxes in total before collecting their goods and leaving the building by 6.15 the following morning. Though not before giving all the hotel workers 20 bucks each for the inconvenience. Huh. <laughs> In total, the gang managed to make off with $27 million in stolen goods and cash. Everything seemed smooth sailing. Now, that is... Wow. That... is the least complicated one of the bunch, to be honest. But yet, it's kind of interesting how that kind of went out. Also, I guess that's kind of nice that they gave the employees money for the inconvenience. I guess? I don't know. It, that just sounds weird. Like, that's a whole thing that's going to bite them in the butt. However, fencing the goods is where things got a little messy. The Lucchese family had a guy who was meant to help them sell some of the more distinctive items. However, he suddenly switched his demands and asked for 33% of the total take. The gang became enraged, so moved the bulk of goods to a safe house in Detroit, Michigan. Once there, they began seeking a new buyer, but the guy they found snitched on them and handed the jewels over to the FBI. The gang members were tracked down and sent to the slammer. Yikes. Had their fence not been so greedy, they'd have made off with a ton of money. What a bummer. Mugging
So, one, this is terrible. Do, if someone ever tries to do this, please, for the love of everything, don't be a part of the it. That is a that is a pain worth generations of things. Second, it sounds like everything was about to work out until you got to the point where it just didn't. Because one person was too greedy. Honestly, that, I don't know if that's ironic, karmatic, or something else, because uh, that's weird how things turned out from being complicated. It's something a bit more simple. It's like a weird whiplash. If that makes sense. Mona. When Vincenzo Perugia entered the Louvre in Paris on August 21st, 1911, he raised very little suspicion. He'd previously worked there as a handyman and was wearing the uniform. He was not there to work, though. Perugia waited patiently until the room his prize was kept in had emptied, then did something almost completely unthinkable. Vincenzo Perugia stole the Mona Lisa. It was as simple as reaching out, lifting it off the wall, and carrying it to a nearby service staircase. There, he wrapped the painting in his clothes and left. Uh, what? Now, the chances of somebody huh? doing this today are slim to none. I don't know if you've been to see the Mona Lisa, but she's quite the social butterfly. Around 30,000 people a day are drawn in to see her smiling face. And okay, that's a good point. How would you do that on paper? The Mona Lisa is safeguarded by lasers, probably. Well, detection lasers. Security cameras. And you can't even get close to it during the day, because... Everyone, and I do mean everyone, wants to see it. So, how could you do that? And she's worth upwards of $950 million. However, back in Perugia's day, she was I considered one of Da Vinci's least impressive billion works, more. and security was far, far more lax. So, where did Perugia... I mean, $50 million more. I thought that would be $50 million more. I thought... 50 billion? I, I think it's invaluable, but not 50 billion. Honestly, I thought it would be over a billion. But, no? Really? That's weird, but okay. Who do you go with his painted woman? Well, after laying low for two years, he tried smuggling the painting into Italy, where he believed he'd lined up a buyer in Alfredo Jerry, a gallerist in Florence. Except once Jerry saw what painting Perugia was trying to sell him, he immediately contacted the police. Perugia was cuffed on the spot, and the painting returned to the Louvre. Yikes. When police were pressing Perugia about his motives, he said it was a matter of patriotism. As a proud Italian, Perugia was enraged that one of his nation's most famous artists' work was being hung in a gallery in yucky France. Bleh. He wrongly believed that the painting had been stolen by Napoleon in the 1790s. However, it had actually been gifted in 1516 to the King of France, the imaginatively named Francis I. Anyways, doesn't profiting off of your pilfered painting undermine that doesn't make sense. Why would you think that? If it's there, it's kind of there for a reason. I mean, if they, if it was stolen, I'm pretty sure both sides would have already went to war already. Just to reclaim one painting. So, yeah, that honestly doesn't make sense. On thinking of how it's stolen. That's the just weird. National hero vibe you're going for. I think it's all a backstory to cover up his get rich quick scheme. But what do you think? Let me know down in the comments. Brazil bank heist. 
Do you know I've always fancied myself as some kind of criminal mastermind? I mean, no one knows what I look like. I'm sure I could get away with it. I just don't like the idea of getting my hands dirty. When a gang of crooks robbed the Banco uh. Central in Fortaleza, Brazil in 2005, they dirtied a lot more than their hands. Three months before burglary day, an unsuspecting business popped up in the center of the city, just a short distance from the bank. From the outside, it looked like any old landscaping business selling grass okay. and plants. Neighbors saw vans of soil being transported from the property every day and thought nothing of it. Little did they know, the landscaping company was a front. Inside, one of the most elaborate heists of the century was well underway. All of that soil wasn't for your typical landscaping job. Beneath the building, a gang between six and ten men had been boring a 256-foot tunnel beneath two city blocks to a position right beneath the bank. The gang of crooks dug and dug until they eventually broke through 3.6 feet of steel-reinforced concrete and popped up straight into the bank vault. Their finished tunnel was roughly 2.3 feet square and ran 13 feet beneath the surface. This wasn't some dank, muddy chute, either. The walls were reinforced with wood and plastic. It was lit throughout, and there was even aircon. Darn. In New York, that'd be 4K a month. But why make it so high-tech? Well, inside the vault at Banco Central was 71.6 million bucks in cash. And all that money was pretty heavy. Around 3.5 tons. Okay. Of smokes. It probably looked something like this. Holy! So, the tunnel had to be structurally sound enough to support moving all that weight through it. The burglars struck on a Saturday and managed to disable the alarms, ensuring they had enough time to transport the huge quantity of money through their tunnel network before the bank was due to open on Monday. Then they popped up out on the other end, loaded it onto a transport, and it was gone. Okay. $71.6 million gone just like that. Now, how did Genius. it get caught? As for what happened to the money, or where the gang went, well, that's where things get a little muddy. The gang behind this audacious theft is thought to have been masterminded by one Luis Fernando Ribeiro. Only, we can't be sure. See, Ribeiro was kidnapped shortly after the heist, and when he was found, well, let's just say... He wasn't in any condition to ask questions. Yikes. And that's been something of a pattern with this crime. Many of the suspects police have wanted to question have wound up mysteriously disappearing. Hmm, the plot thickens. Sounds to me huh. like there might have been a guy on the inside trying to cover his tracks. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Diamond. So it was a perfect heist. But it has a really twisted ending. An ending where those a part of it just stop living. Yeah, that's a. Uh, Hmm. That's gonna be a uh bit of something to take in. So yeah. Men dashers. When Leonardo Notar Bertolo took out a lease on a seven hundred dollar per month apartment huh. in Antwerp's Diamond District back in late two thousand one, it didn't raise too many eyebrows. He introduced himself to everyone as a diamond merchant, so it made sense he'd want to be in the heart of where the business was. Little did Leonardo's associates know, he was only interested in obtaining diamonds at a hefty five-finger discount. See, Leonardo Notar Bartolo is the genius behind the world's largest diamond heist. One worth huh? over $100 million. Oh. Now, this wasn't like in the movies where someone lowers themselves from the ceiling towards some giant glowing diamond. Nah, no. that... Notar Bartolo role-played as a diamond dealer. I was going to say that 
No, nah, that just seemed way too convenient if that was going to be the case. But he was a... He's one of those people that uh, inspected diamonds and all that. Huh. That's actually kind of smart when you think about it. Healer for 18 months while secretly learning intel for his elaborate bust with the help of a cunning crew of fellow criminals. But a few major problems stood in their way. There were cameras, heat sensors, radar, and a lock with over 100 million possible combinations. Each what? of these issues would have to be solved if Notar Bartolo was to be successful. First was the lock. Notar Bartolo managed to hide a tiny camera above the vault, which remained undetected by guards, and was able to record the combination. Next were the heat okay. sensors. The day before the heist, Notar Bartolo visited the vault as he'd done many times before when posing as a diamond dealer. Once inside, he secretly sprayed the thermal motion sensors with hairspray. Ingeniously, the oils in the product temporarily insulated the sensors from fluctuations in the room. It didn't last forever, but it bought the group quite a few hours. As for the big day itself, okay. Notar Bartolo and his gang of thieves were well prepared. they built a scale replica of the vault and had been practicing in it, so they could practically do it with their eyes closed. While Notar Bartolo parked the getaway car, one of his accomplices, known as the King of Keys, picked a lock on an abandoned office building next door. By going through the office building into a private garden it shared with the Diamond Center, the crew now had a way in proper. The Diamond Center itself uh -huh. was accessible by climbing a ladder to a small balcony. This was guarded by an infrared sensor but they blocked their heat signatures by placing a cheap homemade polyester shield in front of it. Huh. Once the gang was in, they disabled the security systems and entered the vault. Now, huh. the vault door could only be opened with a complex, foot-long key, but the King of Keys had managed to replicate it just by watching security footage. Damn, this guy really is a king. Once they were inside Damn. the vault... Almost everything was done in total darkness to minimize their chances of being detected. Incredibly, they knew the layout to the very inch after hours of practice in the replica vault. Using a hand-cranked jack, they opened 123 of 160 safety deposit boxes, grabbed the contents, and emptied it all into duffel bags. Then they left the way they came, making sure to steal the security footage as they did so. Once back at Notar Bartolo's car, the gang loaded the goods into the back and Notar Bartolo drove to the safe house while the burglars proceeded on foot. Notar Bartolo had covered every conceivable detail, even destroying the evidence, which he left to a robber who went by Speedy. Only, Speedy dropped the ball and had a panic attack, throwing all the evidence into a bush instead of burning it like Notar Bartolo instructed. A local hunter who owned the land where Speedy had fly-tipped the evidence found it and called the police. When he told the police Damn. that the envelopes contained in the trash were marked with Antwerp Diamond Center, the cops knew this could be the key to busting the perpetrators. Indeed, they also found a grocery store receipt amongst the discarded documents, and after checking the store's CCTV footage, they were led straight to Notar Bartolo. Yikes. He was sentenced to ten years, while Speedy and two other members of the crew got five years each. The King of Keys was never caught. Except, Notar Bartolo had one more twist in the tale. He later claimed in an interview that a local diamond merchant had hired him to conduct the bust for insurance fraud. Apparently, they overinflated the value of the goods stolen from the true value of $20 million up to $100 million. By claiming the diamonds stolen and getting an insurance payout, there was a lot of money to be made from this. Hmm, who really committed the crime here? Well, it depends on who you believe. According to both Belgian Fair. police and the authors of the leading book on the matter, Notar Bartolo's version of events have no basis in truth. Was he just trying to shift the blame? I'll leave that question to you. And just like that, my jail's looking pretty full. No more crooks for today, guys. Honestly, that was... 
interesting as heck. You never expect this kind of stuff, in all honesty. When you think of this kind of subject, you think of the ones that many people have seen where the robbers have failed and everyone is just like recording that kind of stuff. Yeah, in this case scenario, it's the complete opposite, which is weirdly interesting, I suppose would be the correct word. But yeah, you never really expect this kind of thing. And the fact that a lot of these events only has like one thing that lured everyone of what's going on is kind of hilarious in a way. Yeah, also really surprising because of some of these details that have been mentioned. Like using a certain name using certain locations and all that. Heck, this last one was a brilliantly well-placed plan. The only fault was that one person just panicked and got rid of the evidence the wrong way. Which is weird. Since weren't they just playing this for, like, months? And yet, it was all stopped because one person had a panic attack? Even though they knew that this plan was going to be foolproof? That's just... That just sounds really contradicting. If that makes sense. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this reaction video. If you did, hit the like button down below. Hit the subscribe button to support the channel, support the content provided, and so on and so forth. Hit the notification button to be notified immediately when your video comes out. And tell me what you think of these heist in, in the comment section below. Like, I'm not the only one that thinks a couple of these felt like out of place when it came to how they got caught here and there. I mean, some of them make sense. Others just feel a little out of left field. So, yeah, tell me what you think in the comments section below. Also, again, the link to this video will be down in the description below, so be sure to give that a look. Also, be sure to give BMA some love and support for the video that they made. And, yeah, with all this said, I hope you all enjoy, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!